Uh, okay, uh, hello, welcome to the last series of Agda lectures in the summer school. So um, it's uh, great to see a bunch of you have um, stuck with us this long. Uh, so today, Anders Morberg will be giving his uh, first of three lectures on cubicle Agda. So Anders, please go ahead. Thank you, Carlo, and the rest of the organizers for organizing this great event. Um, it's really cool that so many people from all over the world can learn about hot and cubicle stuff now. Um, okay, let's see. Yes, this is working good. Um, okay, so, right, so lecture seven today is about cubicle like that. So it will be kind of a different way of doing what Martin and Dan has showed you so far. So we're gonna throw out the identity type that you've learned about and instead use path types, uh, which are kind of the core concept in, in cubicle type theory. Um, all right, and I put all the, the like detailed lecture notes here. I hope you can see what I'm doing. So in the Agda folder, there's now a cubicle folder where I'll put all of my material. Um, so far, only lecture seven notes uh, are more or less finished. The others are just very much work in progress, but yeah, so you can go there and yeah, look at them later. There will be more details in the notes than what I will have to, time to cover in the lecture. Okay, cool. So, <clears throat> so cubicle type theory and cubicle like that is kind of, maybe one could say hot 2.0, like the next generation of homotopy type theory where me and many other people started developing different like um, new type theories that are kind of tailored for doing hot stuff. Um, so we'll see like nicer support for higher inductive types and also good computational support for univalence. So when I say computational, I mean really like Agda, if you write the program using univalence, Agda can run it for you um, and hopefully terminate within a reasonable amount of time. And cubicle Agda is one of many implementations of cubicle type theory. And to get Agda into cubicle mode, you just add the following pragma to the top of your Agda file. And now it's a cubicle Agda file. All right. Um, okay. Mm, cool. So I don't know if I need this, but uh, let's do it like this. Okay. So um, what am I going to talk about today? So as I mentioned before, we're going to swap out the identity types so the inductively defined equality type for path types. So I'm going to talk about path types. Uh, and these are built um, from, maybe I should call it the cubicle interval or something, because Dan has showed you the higher inductive interval type and the cubicle interval is slightly different as we'll see. In particular, you can't pattern match on interval, like cubicle interval variables, um, while the higher inductive interval is just something like a normal inductive type, higher inductive type. So that's part one of today. And then part two, I'm gonna talk about uh, and I'm gonna call cubicle high inductive types. <clears throat> and this is this kind of new alternative way of, of representing high inductive types, which make heavy use of these path types and the interval, um, which makes them kind of nicer to use. So you can, you'll see we're gonna define some of the inductive high inductive types that you've seen, like the circle, just as a normal Agda definition and then write definitions by pattern matching instead of using um, recursors and eliminators like Dan did. Okay, so that's the plan for today. Um, okay, and just like Dan, I wrote the little uh, prelude. So like whatever stuff I needed to prepare the lecture, I threw into one file. Um, so the file is kind of a mess, but uh, there's a lot of stuff in there. And most of it is taken from, uh, or all of it is taken from the Agda slash cubicle library, um, which is a library that I've been developing for quite some time now, and which is maybe has become some form of standard library for cubicle like that. But um, there are other libraries uh, like the one lab that you might have heard of, um, which is an 
alternative cubicle IDA library, which kind of focuses on category theory. And they also have a very nicely, uh, like super cool documentation. So if you go to onelab.dev, you can kind of read about everything I'm gonna say, but rendered very nicely uh, with a lot of stuff. Okay, and here's the cubicle IDA library, which now has 73 contributors. So it's quite a big library and uh, might be like, if you wanna do some serious stuff in cubicle IDA, you probably want to base it on one of these two libraries. Okay, so um, that was what I want to say about libraries. Um, so this cubicle pre prelude is some kind of subset, tiny subsets of the, the IDA slash cubicle library. Okay, uh, with the stuff I need. Okay, um, so like I, I said in the beginning, so the path types are, are built out of these uh, cubicle interval variables. So the interval uh, in cubicle like that is written simply i, okay? Uh, and this is like a type, uh, like the natural numbers or whatever, but it's also not exactly uh, like a normal type. So for example, you can't pattern match on it. Um, and there are some other things you can't do with it. Um, so it's kind of a, a primitive built-in thing in cubicle like that. And to be an interval, you kind of need two endpoints. Uh, so the endpoints sitting at each end of this abstract interval type uh, are called i0 and i1. It's kind of the zero and one endpoint, but Calling them zero and one would be kind of confusing for Agda because, well, it could be natural numbers. Um, so we put i in front of them. So i zero is like the starting point of the interval and i one is the end of the interval. Okay. So, right. So I said, this is almost like any old Agda type. So you can do all kinds of things. So now I'm gonna do, let's say we have some type A, and some function p from i into a, uh, then we can get an a by, oh, let's do it with a hole. Let's increase the font in the hole, maybe like that. Okay, so what we can do, p is just like any old um, Agda function now, and this interval thing i, has two elements, i0 and i1. Um, so we can, for example, apply it to i0 and get something in a. Um, so paths, they work, uh, not paths, like functions out of the interval, you should think of kind of as a path in a, uh, starting at I, p of i0 and ending of p at i1. Okay. Um, okay. And we can introduce paths. Uh, let's use some um, implicit arguments. Um, okay, right. So I want to talk about paths. I'm going too fast. Sorry. Uh, oops. All right. Um, okay. So that was the interval. Not so much to say yet, just two endpoints. For now, there will be more stuff very soon. Um, okay, so what are paths? Uh, so path types are um, like, mm, so they're written like x triple bar equals y, like that. So it's the same symbol as you've been using for the inductively defined type, but in cubicle like that is something else. <coughs> so, Let's say we have an element p of this type. Uh, this consists of uh, a function p, or yeah, let's call it p. So some kind of function out of the interval into a such that p of i0 zero, zero is, I'll use double bar for definitionally equal. So the kind of the equality of Agda, the underlying equality uh, of the system. Okay, so it's kind of a, so whenever we write this now, it will mean a function like this, like the one above, with 
the endpoints fixed to be X and Y. Okay. And this is something that cubicle like that under the hood checks for us that whenever we claim that something has this type, it will apply to whatever the thing we construct to I0 and I1 and check that the result is definitionally equal to the endpoints we give. Okay. So now I can construct a path. Okay. So let's construct a path from X to X. So how can we do this? So like I said, it's just like a path is just a function with some side condition. And to introduce them, we used lambda abstraction and we get some scary messages, which you should ignore, okay? So we can get Agda to introduce the lambda abstraction for us. And then, well, we have now an I in the interval in the context and we want to produce an A and we can just put X there, right? So this is a path because when we apply it, to I0, I0, um, we get X. And when we apply it to I1, we get X. So it's a path from X to X, as we've specified in the type. Um, so Agda is happy. Um, yeah. <coughs> and this is, of course, um, just a proof of reflexivity, if you think of this as being equality, as is very suggestive by the name. So let me introduce. Let's rename this to raffle and make this argument implicit. I like to have the x implicit in raffle because I can very often infer it. Okay, so uh, for example, like this. I hope you've seen this notation. It just kind of makes it possible so that you don't have to like write curly braces a, then curly braces x. It just says like bind the X thing in the type to a name X in this case. And yeah, this can then be used in the right hand side. Okay, so good. So we can now introduce REFL. So REFL is not a constructor of this type because it's not inductively defined anymore. So it's really just a function and Agda, um, yeah, checks these two side conditions for it when type checking the term. Um, good. Okay, so like I said, so this interval is not like a normal Agda type. So we can't write, for example, uh, um, let's, so we can't, for example, pattern match on it. So let's say we have a equal type and I wanna make a path in a or a, a function out of i into a to this. So if I ask Agda to case split on this, I get a scary, but not so scary. Can it split an argument of non-data type i? So i is not really a data type. I guess that was the point I wanted to get across and Agda confirms it for us. So you can't pattern match on elements of i. Okay. Um, good. But we can just still, we can just introduce elements of the interval by lambda and so on when constructing paths. Um, good. So, and this is kind of similar to how we can't pattern match on a function, right? I mean, what, what would we pattern match on, so to say? So kind of the same situation with the interval. Okay, good. Um, let me introduce a bunch of, of types. I think you've seen this variable keyword before. It just makes from here on in the file, we have two types, A and B, and I make them uniform polymorphic. So kind of I parameterize by a level L um, and I've introduced some levels in the cubicle preload. Um, so I use like this fancy backslash EL, oops, uh, symbol for levels. While I think both Dan and Martin use slightly less fancy symbol, but uh, I like the, the curly L. Anyway. <clears throat> I'm just doing this so that I don't have to write curly braces a colon type L everywhere. Um, okay, good. Now, um, all right, so what can we now do? So we've seen, I can just introduce REFL as a function, like any old function. And I can also 
um, introduce various things that you've seen in the course, like app. Um, I can just prove for you. Okay, so I'm sure you've seen this a few times. And so the way this was done before was by pattern matching on, on the path P, right? In which case X and Y would be equal. And then you would just put raffle there. Now the path type uh, is not inductively defined. So we can't pattern match on it. Um, <coughs> but remember like we're constructing an element of the path type, so a function. So I can introduce an I in the context and you get, so this is something that happens when you're working in Cuba Collider, you get a lot of yellow and ugly errors like this and they are not really errors. It's mostly like bad user interface programming and it should be improved in the future, but uh, yeah, it's kind of, um, cubicle Ida is still kind of in a <clears throat> slightly more um, early stage than the normal Ida. Okay, but uh, if I ask for the, the, the goal when I'm in this, in the context here, uh, or in this hole, I see that I need to construct a B with the boundary when I equals I zero. So the left endpoint, we need FX and at the right endpoint, we need FY. And this is exactly what this type is, is uh, telling us. Like we wanna construct a path from F of X to F of Y. So we need to construct a function such that when applied to I zero gives us F of X and when applied to I one gives us F of Y. And this is easy because we have our function f. So I can do this interactively. And uh, now we need something in A. And we can get something in A by just taking this path p from x to y and apply it to the interval variable i. Bam. So f is just kind of a, a function that applies to f to the P, which has been applied to the I. So it's really some form of <clears throat> application, applying a function to a path. Uh, you can also see it as comp composing the function with the path, right? Um, it's another way of seeing it. So this is nice. Um, I guess I can should also mention, so Kong is, uh, oops, app is called Kong in, uh, Just so you know. So if someone looks at the slash cubicle library and wants to find app, uh, you have to look for Kong instead. Uh, yeah, but it's just the name. All right. Um, but okay. So this definition is quite nice because, well, for example, if this path that we plug in is REFL, um, it will like reduce to REFL um, essentially, definitionally. And also, like if you compose an app F with an app G, it's the same as composing uh, as doing app with F composed with G and so on. So there, it satisfies a lot of um, nice uh, uh, definitional computation rules. <coughs> okay, definitional slash judgmental. I don't know which terminology you've been using in the hot track. Uh, so when I say definitional, I mean it's judgmental. Uh, if you know, well, yeah, anyway, could also call it, say, strict. There are a lot of words for pretty much the same thing, but anyway. Yeah, the, the dot equals thing. Yep. Dot equals, yeah. In Egbert's book, yeah. Oh, okay, yes, exactly. So that's what I mean when I say definitional. Um, good. Yeah, so it satisfies some nice computation rules like that and that are not satisfied by the app that you define by pattern matching on p um, in book um, so there is an exercise about it uh, see exercise um, that you'll do tomorrow i think um, okay so that's quite nice when you're formalizing mathematics if if you're no, if you have some experience in working in agda or coq or lean or some system you know it's kind of nice to have definitional equalities because the system 
uh, kind of can do the proofs for you. You need to prove that something is equal to something else. And if the system knows that they are equal definitionally, you don't have to do anything. So the more things that are definitionally equal, the nicer your life gets when working in a proof system. Um, <clears throat> okay, good. Um, another cool thing we can do um, is, to is to prove phonics to function extensionality. Um, which I think Dan has, uh, well, which you've surely heard about. I don't know if Dan proved it in, in Agda from univalence, but you can prove it as a consequence of univalence, but in cubicle Agda and other cubicle systems, it has a much more direct proof. Okay, well, so if we have two functions that are pointwise, equal, then the actual functions are equal. Okay, so how can we prove this? Um, okay, so let's like, often when you try to prove something in Agda, just put a hole and ask Agda to refine things for you. Now you get scary errors, but we can ignore them. And I don't like lambda symbols, so I just put this in the context, bam, okay. Now it's more readable um, <clears throat> as well. So what are we trying to do? So we have this P, which given an X, gives us a path from F of X to G of X. And we now, because I kind of introduced everything, we want to construct a path from f of x to g of x. So this looks very easy now, uh, but let's put the x back in context. So now we want to construct um, a function type. So this is the equality between f and g because f and g are functions, um, which uh, has a very scary looking boundary. <clears throat> but like whenever we're constructing a function, we can just put an x in the context or to the left of the equality sign, and now everything looks more readable. <clears throat> so how can we do this with the stuff we have? Well, we can do P and apply it to X. This is something from F of X to G of X, or a path from F of X to G of X. And if we just apply it to I, um, it will be an element of B, which has the correct boundary. So. The proof of phonics is really, really trivial and might look kind of too trivial to be true. Um, so it's essentially just swapping the arguments i and x to p, which um, might seem very magical first time you kind of see it. Um, but uh, you can convince yourself that this actually <clears throat> makes sense. Um, by like, uh, well, this is probably better to do by hand oneself, but like uh, to convince oneself that this makes sense, uh, plug in i0 for i and i0 and i1 for i. So if you do that in this term, you, you're going to see that this is actually um, has the correct type. And the fact that cubicle Agda accepts the definition, <coughs> of course, means that it has the correct type, but uh, sometimes it's nice to like type check things by hand, uh, especially when one is trying to get used to a new system. Just to show that like, I couldn't write anything here. Um, let's swap this to, then we get an error message. So, I mean, something is happening. I'm not just writing like land, random characters. So Agda is checking something. <clears throat> okay, but uh, it can be quite instructive, I think, to, to do this. But I think it makes more sense you do it yourself. And if you're confused, you can ask one of the TAs um, than me doing it here. Okay, so what have we done? So. I've talked a little bit about the interval and then the fact that path types are defined from the interval um, instead of being inductively defined as before. Um, and you've seen that the interval has two endpoints, I0 and I1. And in uh, cubicle Agda, we also have um, three operations on I. 
So uh, minimum, which is written uh, like this. And maximum. It's written like that. And then something we call symmetry, which is a unary operator tilde like that. So, <clears throat> uh, so these are maybe, I should say, these are kind of special for uh, cubicle agda. Some other variations of cubicle type theory don't have these and technically you don't need them, but it's quite nice to have them. Um, so the min and the max are kind of what you expect. So if you like have two points in the interval, maybe then you can take their min and their max essentially. Uh, and the symmetry kind of, if you think of this as the real interval, it corresponds to taking one minus X. Um, so these operations are <clears throat> satisfy various laws and you can read about them in the notes, but uh, uh, let me just show how you can use them instead. Anders, we have a yes. couple of students confused about the definition of fun X. Uh, where does the X argument come from? Could you explain that again? Aha, uh -huh. here, yes, sure. Let's do it like this. Okay, so, okay, let's do this slightly slower. Let's just put the, the P in the context, this thing. Okay. Um, so now it's kind of, it's the goal upstairs, um, as we expect. Now, this thing here, is a path, so it's a function. So we can introduce it using lambda, like that. <clears throat> and then, so it's a path in a function type. So it's a path between two functions. So it's a path in A, R, O, B, right? So the goal here is something in A, R, O, B, which when I is zero is F, and when I is one is G. Um, so like now we're under the hood of this equality, so to say, like we've introduced the interval thing in the context and we can explore further um, the goal. And because the goal, or, or we can construct the goal even further, kind of we can, we can progress more. And because the goal is, is a function, we could just lambda abstract again, All right? And now we need to construct a B uh, such that when we kind of go outside this lambda and plug in I zero, we should get F of X. And when we go outside this inner lambda X and plug in I one, we should get G of X. And this is exactly what the P does for us. Um, I don't know if that was clear. Right, you can also just squint your eyes and and basically what Funext is doing if if you forget about all the boundary stuff is that P goes from A to I or B, and then the uh, the F equals G thing is um, I arrow A arrow B, right? Right, right. So P is like A to uh, B, and uh, the goal is in. Let's put in parentheses to make it even clearer. That might also be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I think that clears things up. Yep. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Thanks for for uh, asking questions. I'm. Uh, yeah. It's great. 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 Um. Right, so funny, so yeah, so, so it's like a seemingly trivial definition, but it takes a lot of kind of brain power to wrap one's head around it first time one sees it. So uh, don't, don't worry. Uh, we've all been baffled by it at some point in our life. Um, okay, good. So what was I saying? Yeah, I was saying we have three operations on the interval, a min, a max, and a symmetry operation. Um, and if you look in the, 
Cubic Lambda library or the one lab, you, you're gonna see them used quite a lot because they're, so especially these two, the min and the max, they're called connections uh, also <clears throat> in the literature and they are very useful to construct uh, squares from lines. So very often when you want to do some kind of higher dimensional reasoning, you want to construct a specific square or a cube with a specific boundary, then these are your friends. Um, but when you get into cubic collider, it can seem quite uh, confusing at first. Um, like, but after a while, one gets used to constructing high dimensional things out of these operations. But I don't think I'm gonna go into that too deeply. I'm just gonna show you that we can also do low dimensional stuff with them. For example, we can construct sim um, using the symmetry operation. <clears throat> So what is sim? It's the thing that's been called uh, bang by, uh, so Dan called, uh, yeah, okay, bang or I think, yeah, minus one. So kind of inverting a path or a symmetry proof. <clears throat> okay, uh, but I'm calling it sim to match the cubicle like the library notation. Okay, so how could we do this? So now we have P, which is a path from X to Y, and we want a path from Y to X. So if this would have been a non-cubicle like that, we would just do pattern matching, but here we can't do that. So we instead use this symmetry operation. And because we're constructing a path, we can, put the interval variable in the context and we're constructing an a which when i is zero is y and when i is i one it's x and this is exactly what this tilde operation does oops so it's kind of taking one minus i that's the idea so when you plug in i zero for i you take one minus zero, which is one. Uh, so P at one is Y. So that will be kind of the starting point of the result. And then, yeah, similarly for the other endpoint. <clears throat> so this is kind of nice how you can do a lot of the stuff you've seen just using this kind of um, operations on the interval and so on. And like I said, these can be used to construct higher dimensional things out of lower dimensional things. Um, but I don't think I will show that now because I won't really want to get on to the higher inductive type. So I might go back and do that later if I have time. Uh, but otherwise, it's all in the notes. <clears throat> OK, um, something else that I want to say. So uh, yeah, OK, for examples of, uh, oops inputs for now. I might show some examples later, but let's not do that now. Um, okay, but uh, another thing I, I also want to mention, so you've seen this path over, uh, path overs uh, in Bookot um, are called path P in Kubelagda. So path P stands for path over a path, um, could also be Dependent path maybe would have been a good name, but we ended up with path P um, when we designed the system. <clears throat> and these are actually the primitive notion so for paths. So I've been a little bit lying to you when I pretended like the primitive notion is this triple bar thing. Actually, the primitive notion is path P. Um, so path overs are the primitive notion of paths, um, cubicle like that, another cubicle type theory. Um, so, yeah, so in fact, so when I write x, whoops, triple bar equals y is short for path p lap lap. So, assuming that x and y are, are of type a, this is short for path p. The, the path we're over, so it's just a lambda abstracted thing um, between x and y. 
So this is just notation. And if I middle click it, I jump to its definition. And yeah, it's defined in Agda built in cubicle.path. So it's built into Agda, and, and the, the built in thing is path like it's, yeah, <clears throat> like. The internal thing is past p, which is introduced as a postulate here, but then it's a built in thing, so I that knows what it means, blah, blah, blah. But uh, my point was just that this triple bar thing is just defined as path p, um, as I said here. So that will be good to know because uh, we're going to need some pathovers when talking about our inductive types, um, just like Dan needed pathovers. And also having um, like heterogeneous equality. Um, so equality where the endpoints of the equality are in different types um, as the primitive notion actually makes a lot of sense. And maybe, um, yeah, I would say it simplifies many things instead of having it defined in terms of homogeneous equality where the endpoints are, are fixed to be in the same type. So uh, yeah, you'll see <coughs> that very soon. So. Like, I don't know, I could have refl p, uh, which is just a path p. Oh, and this would just be defined as the other, or this could just be written refl. Oops. Oh no, it gets confused about levels. Oh no, okay, well, uh, yeah, okay. Well, in principle, yes, and I can fix this, but I'm not going to fix it now. Um, but it's fixed in the notes, I uh, think. So, but anyway, so refl, because this is it's like x equals x is just a shorthand for this. So we should be able to plug in refl, but sometimes I get confused about levels when you're using variables and stuff like that. So uh, this didn't work. But my point was just you can introduce this path piece just like you introduce the triple bar equality. Um, like, I guess I can do it this way. Okay, so we can define it the same way. Um, and now I isn't confused because we're not trying to plug in another definition, which was somehow fixed to another universe. Um, but anyway, so you could just introduce path piece the same way as you would introduce uh, the paths we've seen so far. That was my only point. <clears throat> and then when I the type checks this, it checks that like this path that we're introducing has these two endpoints, and also that the right hand side has this path applied to zero as type, and then the right hand side is this thing applied at one. In this case, the type is constantly A, so it doesn't really matter, but um, we'll see more complicated examples soon. Good. Um, all right. So, so what have we done so far? Interval i. Okay. We also have uh, paths. So the triple bar thing and path overs. Path uh, now, let's talk about the second thing I want to talk about. So, cubicle higher inductive types. <clears throat> Actually, if yes. I could just stop you before you get started on HIDs. We have had a couple of questions which are like to the effect of what the hell is the interval type? Why is it not just a data type? And so on. Like, why is it so magical? Could you? Elaborate on that a bit. Uh, yes, I can. So, all right. So the explanation will use things that I will get into uh, next time. But essentially, so I guess what I can say uh, is, so far I've managed to construct. Like I picked examples of 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 lemmas or terms that do not require any path induction or transport. Um, as you might have noticed, I've managed to do everything with just the interval and like flipping things around and using these operations and so on. And that's because I picked examples where you can do that. Um, there are a bunch of things I cannot prove. 
without uh, having path induction or some form of transport operation. And this is the what I'm going to talk about. Next lecture is the plan. Um, and what is so magical about the interval is that you don't have a transport operation for it. Um, and the reason is, uh, well, let's say it's deep. Uh, for those that know some uh, abstract homotopy theory, it's because the interval is not vibrant in the models. But uh, maybe this doesn't make any sense to you. And don't worry about it. Just trust me that you can't, you can't define a transport operation for the interval. And this means like all other types in cubicle like that have transport operations built in. Um, uh, but the interval doesn't. So it's not a regular type, it's not a normal type in that sense. Um, did that help? Hopefully. Uh, we'll assume that it's helped and if... Yeah, so... If somebody, if, if somebody who's asked the question before um, speaks up, I'll, I'll interrupt you again. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if I can say something else, but uh, I mean, that's the real reason. Um, um, it might seem very magical. Um, so it's essentially, it's a special built-in type that you cannot pattern match on and you cannot transport in it. So it's not like a normal type. Um, so yeah. And the reason is kind of because mathematics works that way. Um, and to explain this in any deeper or in any more detail, I would have to uh, give a whole uh, set of different lectures. So just trust me for now, and I, I'll be happy to talk more about it privately or maybe in the end of next lecture or something. OK, good. Um, but yeah, so for now, just think of it as kind of a, a slightly funny type. Um, but <clears throat> not too funny. I mean, just as two endpoints and a few operations. Okay. Good. Um, all right. So second part. So this higher inductive types, um, you've seen a bunch of them. So uh, it's, you've seen, I think you've seen the circle S1 thing then called circle two, which was the suspension of the booleans pretty much. Um, what else did you see? Um, Taurus and some other example. I think he skipped over the others pretty quickly, um, I suspect. But anyway, so this like topological examples, um, circles, spheres, torus, and so on, we can just define them as higher inductive types, just like Dan did and reason with them. Now, um, so, uh, so Dan introduced these using postulates, right? He put like postulate S1 is a type and then uh, base is the element of S1 and you have a path loop and so on. Uh, so, uh, so that's what Dan did. We will introduce them or like in cubicle like that. And just write them as data types. We'll see, which will be nice because, uh, uh, in particular, you don't have to postulate uh, the recursor slash eliminator, which uh, can instead use uh, pattern matching. So, which is quite nice because you can just write like nice pattern matching equations when mapping out of higher inductive types when working in cubicle like that, <clears throat> as opposed to what Dan was doing, where you have to be kind of clever to postulate exactly the right recursive eliminator, and then you need to program with them everywhere, which gets quite annoying, I think. Also, um, because things are defined using pattern matching, things compute nicer, let's put it that way. So. I think then at some point also had to postulate how the recursor and the eliminator computes on, for example, the loop constructor. This is handed automatically in cubicle either when you do things using pattern matching this way. So you'll see nicer computational behavior. Okay, so 
Dan also used to rewrite rules for the uh, for the eliminators on the point constructors, and we won't need that here either. Oh yeah, so we won't need any rewrite rules. Yes, and also Dan only managed to. I mean, he only used rewrite rules for the point constructor, and not for the higher constructors. Here we'll get kind of built-in rewrite rules or computational definitional uh, definitional computation rules in Agda for all constructors. Uh, so which is very useful when you're trying to prove things because things just hold by refl while uh, yeah otherwise you might have to do a lot of work to convince Agda why things hold anyway you'll see examples so it's, let's introduce the circle i'm going to use uppercase one as a type where and when i do Agda i like to press ctrl c l a lot so currently it has no constructors but the color is nice um, so we have S a base point, and then we have the loop, which is a path from base to base. So, so this is pretty much what you want to write, uh, I guess. Uh, so no postulates, just you write a data type, you specify the point constructors, and you specify the path constructors. And um, yeah, you can write a lot of yeah, very, very many cool higher inductive types this way in Cubicle like that and work with them. So let's write this doubling function that Dan had. Oops. Okay. Now we're going to see the magic of pattern matching and uh, Agda case splitting for us, uh, which you've probably seen for other data types, but it also works for higher inductive types. Bam. So if I case split on X, I get two cases, case for base, case for loop. Let's do the base case, uh, base, base, case, whatever, first, like this, the base case, done. And then now the loop case. Um, so here things look slightly different. So for Dan, he had to do like app double on loop. He had to do something for, but uh, here we have instead loop double applied to loop of I. And the rationale behind this is that this, remember this is actually just like a fancy function from I to S1 uh, with endpoints base and base. Right, so this is just like in cubic like that, this equality or path here is just a fancy function with some side conditions on the endpoints, which means that when we pattern match on it, um, we have this I here, just like, I don't know, when you take lists, you have the nil constructor, and then you have the cons constructor, which uh, is from A to list of A to list of A. So then you would pattern match on like cons X X's. Here we pattern match on loop of I instead. So it's kind of exactly the same thing um, as it's kind of parameterized constructors. And then we can do what Dan did. So he wanted to double the thing. So he wants to take loop composed with loop. Okay. And we also have this kind of, I also use backslash dot for composition. Um, I haven't explained how it's defined, but for now, trust me, we can define it. Um, I will talk about it next time in detail, but for now, let's use it as a black box. So if I compose loop with loop, I have something from base to base or path from base to base, but I want something in S1 because we have introduced this I here in the context. So I have to apply this whole thing, which remember is a function to I. Then I get something in S1 and well, Agda is happy. Um, so cool, we can write things by pattern matching. And when we write this kind of clauses like this, Agda automatically checked like if we plug in zero for I here, uh, will be same as having a zero there, and then it will check that um, everything matches up, so to say, because if this would have been zero, loop at zero is base. So whatever you write this right hand side will have to also be base. In this case, the endpoints of everything here is base, uh, but the, you'll surely see examples where 
things get more complicated. Um, but so I think that does more than one might think. I guess that's what I want to say. Okay, but it's nice. We can write functions by pattern matching on high inductive types. Um, okay, so now I also wanted to show things we can do with univalence and I'm going to use just a black box for now. Um, and I'm going to do the example Dan did. So one part of proving that the omega of S1 or pi 1 of S1 is the integers is defining a map like the, the covering space, the helix above the, the circle. Um, so let me just do that for now. So it's a map into the universe type. So it's a family of types indexed by the circle. And let's pattern match at base. We take oops, uh, the integers, right? And then at loop, we wanna have um, a path. So we need a path from the integers to the integers, which if you like transport forward, it applies to successor. And if you transport backwards, it applies to predecessor. Uh, and because this predecessor and successor form an equivalence, you can package them up using univalence and get a path, um, just like Dan did. Um, under the hood, there are different, uh, like, yeah, different notions, but uh, the idea are the same. So this is called suck path for successor path. Okay. If I middle click this, we get to some very tiny code, but Essentially, I have thrown in the definition of the integers as a type. Slightly, I picked a slightly different definition than Dan, but yeah, uh, I, I prefer this one because here you have only two constructors, Dan had three. So I have less cases. So you have a post constructor and then minus one plus n. Um, so this means you don't have two zeros. Um, anyway, no of by one. But anyway, then you can define successor and predecessor on these integers and prove that they cancel and so on. And you can then package this up into an isomorphism. So maps back and forth that cancel. And then we have a lemma called iso to path, which takes an isomorphism, um, improves it to an equivalence, and then hits it with UA. So the map from equivalences to paths. And then you get a path out. So. Uh, Good. I will go into more detail about this, like what is univalence and cubicle light and so on. Like it's something you can prove suddenly, but I don't want to talk about it now. So for now, use it as a black box. But uh, yeah. And I guess I could also say like, if you're using the cubicle like the library or the one lab, you can use a lot of the operations and lemmas like as black boxes. Like you don't have to, if I middle click this now, we're gonna see something that will look scary. Uh, where is it? Here it is. So it looks kind of scary. It's some kind of age comp thing, which I haven't talked about, but um, like when you're writing code like this and you have a library in the background that has dealt with all the scary stuff, you can kind of forget or not learn so much about the scary stuff and just use the, the operations that are provided by the library. Um, so, so many of the things I'll talk about in more detail next time, you might not work with so much in practice if you have a good library to work with. Um, so uh, yeah, and like this looks pretty much like what Dan did, except we're doing pattern matching instead of uh, using the uh, recursor or eliminator explicitly. Okay. Um, all right, so now I've done this kind of uh, a tiny part of, of the proof that pi one of S1 is the integers that Dan did. Um, but this will be sufficient for what I want to show now. So I'm just doing a simple special case. So uh, now I can define a function winding, which goes from paths in the circle from base to base uh, to the integers and confuse the winding number. So like the topological or the, how do you say, the intuition for this helix thing as the name suggests is kind of, 
some kind of vibration above the circle, which when you go around, you increase one. And when you go around in the other direction, you decrease, decrease by one. Um, so if you transport along this thing, we get a map that kind of counts how many loops have we composed? Like how many times did we go clockwise and how many times did we do counterclockwise? And then we see uh, what the output is. So, okay. So to define this thing, just like I just said, we need transport. And I will go into more detail about transport in the cubicle setting on, on Friday, as I promised before. But for now, let me just say there is an operation called transp, which um, takes three arguments. I'm going to fix one of them to be I0. I will explain this in more detail later. I get scary error messages. but. Uh, Mm. What we want to do is essentially we want to transport uh, along P uh, zero, essentially. Um, well, uh, yeah. So we want to apply helix to P, then transport in the path that you get, uh, transport element zero. So let's just do that. So this will look kind of magical now, but uh, we can write this. So this is going to be like you transport. Uh, P uh, along P, but we turn it into a like a path in the integers essentially, uh, and then we transport zero along this path. Okay, I will revisit this later, but now let's just see this. So I think Dan showed you the same thing, and then showed you can kind of compute with this, like compute the winding number of some element in base equals base, um, but you have to do it by hand. Here we can do it. Mm. By, uh, uh, so this should be two. Let's do it this way. Okay, so wasn't too impressive, but let me show you. Like, uh, everything is so tiny, but if you press Control C, Control N, you can tell Agda to normalize something for you. So let me normalize. I don't know loop composed with sim loop composed with loop so now we have some kind of gnarly compositions of loops and sim of loop and so on and we compute the winding number if you press oh no what did i do wrong ah uh, okay i need parentheses because i didn't set the fixity of the dot operator the right way okay but it works if you put in enough parentheses and uh, yeah cool i'll fix that in the, the notes let me just write it down so i don't forget it um okay so you see we can have run this transport um and it's a transport using a path which under the hood uh was using well univalence it you can't see it here because i clicked too far but under the hood is using univalence and this is what i say when i was saying that like univalence computes nicely um that just means like this transport um computes definitionally in agda while for dan you would have to kind of compute compute manually you would kind of have to rewrite step by step until get the thing out and having these things compute uh, definitionally by agda really saves you a lot of headache uh, when doing complicated proofs okay um yeah and i mean one can following the uh, lecture uh, one can prove that uh, Winding is an equivalence using the encode decode method, which I think you've seen in the hot track, or we'll see. Um, but you also saw it in dance lecture. So you can do all of those proofs also cubically and uh, end up with a proof that uh, base equals base uh, is equivalent to the integers. 
So the, the loop space of the circle is the integers. Good, but I'm not gonna do that now. Um, uh, but it's of course in the cubic like the library. So see uh, cubicle dot hits dot s one dot base. If you go to this file in the cubic like the library, you you will see, find this proof. But I'm not gonna redo it here. It's kind of very similar to what Dan did, but you can streamline some parts using cubicle tricks um, that you haven't seen yet. So let me instead show another uh, cool example. So the torus. OK, well, any questions about the circle or transporting with univalence or anything before I move on? OK, good. I'm, I assume the TAs have answered all the questions um, in the chat. So, okay, so the torus. Um, so Dan gave it in his lecture. I'm going to do it as well, but as a data type. OK, so how are we going to do this? Well, the idea is um, to kind of, um, OK, I'm just going to copy paste something. Uh, where is it? I could have prepared this. Here we go. Ha. Okay, so here's the idea. We're going to use a nice kind of um, pasting diagram, uh, like in topology, where you kind of have a square, like a sheet of paper, and we're going to identify two sides and then the, the top and the so the the right and the left side we identify, and then the top and the bottom we identify, and then we've constructed a torus. So now we're going to do that, but as our inductive type. So we're going to have one base point, P, um, or I'm going to call it point. Um, and then we're going to have two lines, line one and line two. And then we're going to have a square identifying uh, line two with line two over an <clears throat> identification of line one with line one. And that would kind of correspond to this uh, gluing diagram or pasting diagram or whatever you want to call it. Um, folding diagram, maybe that's what it's called. Um, good. Okay, <clears throat> so what did I say? We need a point. And we need two lines from point. The point. And then we need the <clears throat> interior of this picture here a square a square okay so that's the interior so let's just and so now i i like i i said i need a path from line two to line two over an identification of line one with line one and that's where we want to use a, um, a path over which we saw were called path P. <laughs> so let's say I have an identification of line one with itself. Um, yeah, okay, let me just type the thing and then I'll explain it. Okay, so we want an identification of line two with line two. And we do this <coughs> over this identification of line one with line one. Um, and here we see kind of how this cubicle mm, structure emerges out of this path piece. So, because now we constructed a square, that is kind of a degenerate case of a cube, but it's a low dimensional case of a cube, but we could imagine having a path P. So another path P identifying a square with another square over some other squares, and that would be a cube and so on. So this kind of the cubicle structure is emerging <clears throat> from the structure of the type theory. Um, so it's kind of iterated path types gives you cubes and hypercubes and um, whatever you want. Okay, <coughs> sorry. Good. Um, so 
it's a nice definition of the torus, I guess. Uh, exercise, define the client bottle, uh, kind of fun. Then you need some twists, right? Uh, if you know how to construct a client bottle as a folding diagram, um, then you can try to do that as an inductive type. Um, I should add this as an exercise to the exercises, but uh, I just thought of it. It's nice, um, cool. Okay, but uh, yes, so what did I want to do? So I think Dan mentioned, maybe Dan constructed the maps from the torus to the circle, uh, two copies of the circle, so torus. Like that. Um, I think he constructed this map and it's inverse, but it didn't prove that they're inverse because it turns out to be really tricky. So I have a quick question about the torus definition. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, could you have written uh, for square line one compose line two equals line two compose line one? Ah, oh, that's right. So what is a line one compose? Yeah, or line I mean, whichever two. order. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you said the other word. But... Uh -huh. Yes, you could. But it's not the definition of the same as this thing. Um, yeah. For So I guess very hard exercise. Prove that the two. OK, let me. Uh, let's call this uh, Taurus Prime. Okay, I'm gonna revert this. Yeah, so harder exercise. Prove that torus uh, is equivalent to torus prime. So, like the reason they're not directly equivalent is because this is a path between two different compositions of paths. While well, this is uh, a, like a filler for this particular square. Um, if you don't understand what I mean, don't worry about it. It's not super important, but it's kind of, I guess my point is just these two things are not definitionally the same, um, but you can of course write this version, um, but proving that it's equivalent to this one will be hard. That's all I'm saying. And I would say like this definition is much easier to work with. Um, yeah, but maybe Dan used this definition in his talk, I don't, or in his lecture, I don't remember. Um, and it might be that when working in book cut, this definition is slightly easier to work with than this one. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, um, yeah. Cool. Good question. Um, yes. But uh, let's stick to, okay, I'm going to just copy this up here for now so that we have the definition in view while defining this. So we want to do. I uh, have these great names, C2T and T2C. Um, that might actually be what they're called in the library. Well, and <coughs> not great, but uh, it's fine. Okay. So, I mean, it's kind of a classic result, I guess, or like a, a standard result in topology that like a torus, it's just two copies of the circle. And <clears throat> you can prove it by constructing maps and proving that they cancel. And uh, constructing the maps is easy. Okay. Um, how do we do it? Well, <coughs> so where should we map the point? Well, um, I mean, a good candidate is base comma base. I don't think there's much else you could pick, um, right? Because we don't have any interval variables around, so we can't really use the loop. So it really has to put, pick, send it to the base comma base element of S1 times S1. Now here we have a choice though. So we got to send it to a pair. So now we can choose, do we want the first or the second component to be the loop? Um, I'm going to choose the first. And then for line two, I'm going to do the opposite choice. And here we have to do something. Well, 
there is essentially only one thing we can do. We have this to do pi and this to do j. <coughs> and now what Agda does under the hood is making sure that like what we wrote here makes sense, that if we plug in zero and one for i and j here, we end up with all these different cases the desired way. And we can kind of, if I swap, if I put j here and i here, we will get an error message. Base is not equal to loop. Um, yeah, it wasn't very helpful because it just says that the definition is wrong and not where it goes wrong, but uh, I can, I know where it went wrong because I, I made it wrong. But anyway, Agda is making sure that this is a coherent definition, which makes sense. Okay. Now to define the inverse, k split, call this x and y. And we k split some more. And now you'll see you can just keep on k splitting in Agda. And you get all the four cases you want. And well, if you want to define an inverse to t to c, we kind of know what we have to put everywhere because we just look what did we do in this definition and we repeat it here so point base loop that was line two loop base that was line one <coughs> sorry mm -hmm. cool now we have <coughs> maps in both directions and we want to prove that they uh, cancel. Mm. All right. So how do we do that? Well, we see to we just state it, and it's kind of tedious to write. But uh, let's see. If, so I get them in the right order. We have t in the torus. Then we do c two t after t two c of t. Okay, and how do we prove this? Well, probably just case split again. And now, um, I that is play some junk that one should not read. Um, but the interesting point here is the goal, and the goal is just we need point equals point. And we can put refo line one equals line one refo line two equals line two refo. I just want to rename that guy, and now it's square equals square. So that's also refl. So, yeah, kind of fast because the proof is kind of trivial um, because we have like sets things up in a way that makes the well the two things obviously inverse to each other, uh, modulo pattern matching. <coughs> Okay, let me prove the converse. Well, uh, T to C. Well. Oh. Quickly. So once again, we do this by simply by pattern matching. And as you see, Agda generates kind of silly names, and then I rename them by hand. Um, that will happen a lot to you, I guess, as well. And we just pattern match on everything, and all cases are refl again. I'm going to do this fast so that I can get to the punchline of everything. But trust me, you could just redo this proof slowly yourself if you want to see what's really happening. But everything is kind of trivial, modulo, some pattern matching. Um, and that's really cool. So this is the whole proof that the torus is equivalent to two circles, except we need to use uh, uh, like an analog of dance improve lemma, which takes an isomorphism and promotes it to an equivalence. And I'm just going to go the whole way to a path, because that's cool. Let's do it this way. I like naming things 
the thing I want to prove because then I can do what I just did and just insert spaces and typing gets faster. Cool. Okay, so just to build a path, we use this magical lemma ISO to path, which takes an ISO, which is a com combination of two, four things. Uh, oh God, I never remember which one is the section, which one is the retraction. Okay, I got them wrong. T2, C, C2, T. Okay, good, 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 good. So anyway, this is essentially just packaging everything up that I did into a path using univalence and improving an isomorphism to an equivalence. Okay, cool. So, th so this proof is very slick. The corresponding proof in Bukot is uh, very long. Um, and the reason is that like you don't get nice, um, okay, I should scroll down here. Like these cases and these cases do not hold by Ruffle anymore because like just to write down these things, you need to write down, write them with app. And here you need some kind of iterate the two dimensional app thing and it gets very complicated. Um, but here, because paths are just functions, um, we can write things very nicely with pattern matching and things kind of magically work. Um, good. All right. Um, what am I doing on time? I'm doing pretty well. Um, I can show, do I continue until six or do I take questions and we end at six? Um, I think you'll, you'll go until the end and then we'll, uh, we'll maybe ask a few questions after that. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know which example I should show up 10 minutes. Um, Yeah, I guess I could show a few more higher inductive types. So, right. So now we've seen this kind of, I don't know what to call them, basic or uh, something, higher inductive types where you're just like, you have a base point, you have a loop, there are no parameters. You're just like adding identifications between elements of the type. Um, and then I think Dan quickly glossed over some slightly more complicated higher inductive types. So let me just write down a few more high inductive types and then we'll add um, more bits. So, <clears throat> uh, so for example, suspension um, is a nice one because it lets us construct higher, oops, uh, it should be a colon, types from a type. And so this is kind of different from the ones before because we have a, a parameter here in the type. So you take the suspension of a type and that gives you a new type. So um, like if you take the suspension of the Booleans, you get a circle um, and so on. So what do we have? We have North and South. Okay, and then we have a Marid, which says that for all A and A, we have a path from North to south. So what we're kind of doing is we're adding a north pole, a south pole, and then a family uh, of paths from the north pole to the south pole um, parameterized by the type A. So if A has two elements like the booleans, we're just adding two paths. So it's like constructing a circle, but with two, two points. Um, so it's like dance circle two um, and so on. And then if you iterate this, you take suspension of, of the circle, you get the sphere or yeah, the S2, the two sphere. And then if you iterate that, you get the three sphere and so on and so forth. So you can define the N, N sphere as an N fold suspension of pool. Um, I might be off by one, but you iterate suspension and you get higher dimensional spheres. So that's cool. Um, Good. And this is, I mean, this is a little bit more complicated. You have a parameter here. You also have a parameter here in the constructor. Um, I don't know if I can show you an example. No, I'm freestyling, so anything can happen. But uh, okay, let's do suspension of S1 to suspension of S1. Just to show you what happens. So I can case split as normally. And now, um, Let's 
Let's flip the thing around. That's a fun function. I don't know, but uh, the only point here is essentially that Merid here has two parameters, one for the A here and one for the kind of the hidden interval thing that is hidden inside this path B here or this path here. We could do Merid A sim of I. So maybe not call it foo, let's call it uh, flip. Okay, so that was a point of that was essentially like, yeah, the more the more things you put here, the more arguments you get to your constructors when you pattern match. Um, yeah, I pr probably went fast over that up here, but uh, like in the torus, we have this path P, which is an, uh, a square. So there we have two interval variables, i and j. Uh, so we have two parameters to the square constructor. Yeah. Good. And then the so suspension, what else did I do? I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. Push out. It's good, I guess. Um, so this is more complicated. So we need A, B, C, three types. <coughs> and then two functions, F, A to B, G from A to C. Oh, uh, and this is a lot. Okay, good. All right. And you probably want to put uh, levels everywhere and so on, but I'm I'm omitting that now for simplicity. But you probably want to be able to take the push off types in different universes and so on. But I'm I'm gonna omit that. Um, okay. So what was the push out? So this defines a span for us. So we have a uh, arrow b here. Oh, you're gonna see my ASCII art drawing skills. Uh, I need some more. Whoa. Yeah, my ASCII art drawing skills are not great. Sorry. But anyway. Um, like that. And then we form the, the push out is, uh, you take the push out of this span. So it lives over there, right. Um, okay, so we need a map going down like this. And we need a map going right like this. And I'm going to call them in left and in right. Good. And then um, we need a, I mean, now we just have maps going into this thing. So it's not a push out. The push out, we also need to identify the images. Like if you go from here to here and then down, it should be the same as going from here to here and then right. So uh, call this the push constructor. Um, so what did I say? In left of, oh no, now my in, in the drawing I made, the in left is on the right. I'm sorry for that, but I'm not gonna try to change it now. Um, ah, okay, cool. So, so now we have a family of identifications um, of the images of F and G. And this is in form of homotopy push out of this span of types. Um, and I suspect you're gonna see this high inductive type in the hot lectures if you haven't already seen it. It's very useful for constructing other types. Um, there will be some exercises about it, but like, the suspension you can construct as a push out. Um, and because like I said, all the spheres um, are constructible from suspension. Um, yeah, they're also constructible from push outs and so on. So by proving lemmas about the push out, you uh, get lemmas about all the different high inductive types, uh, all the other like simpler high inductive types for free. Okay.
Um, good. So uh, now I think it's time to wrap up. I have a few more minutes. So let me just, uh, oh, someone raised a hand. I don't know if you want to take that question now or if I should wrap up first. Maybe I keep I'll going. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll wrap up and then we take questions. Um, okay, so, uh, so today, good. We saw interval and path types and uh, uh, key would call hits. And the next time I plan to do um, well, cubicle transport essentially and path induction. So you didn't really, I didn't really need it now because I picked examples where you don't need it, like I said before, but there are a lot of things I can't do with what I've shown you so far. So you need more stuff. And this is what I'm gonna talk about next time. And then I'm also gonna put, show a bunch of set truncated hits uh, and I'll work with them. And that I think like all of these examples that we saw now are very topological or homotopical in nature. And that's nice, of course, but there's a lot of higher inductive types that just live on the set level. So zero types that are very useful for computer science applications and like, uh, yeah, normal set level mathematics like algebra and uh, analysis and so on. So uh, that's what I'm gonna focus on next. And the only difference, well, um, so you define these kind of higher inductive types, but you also need to throw in a, a truncation uh, constructor, which kind of squashes the, the higher structure and throws it out. So that's what I'm gonna talk about next time. All right, good. Great, uh, thank you very much, Anders. Um, and uh, so as a reminder, uh, tomorrow there will be a problem solving session um, Anders next lecture will be on Friday, so if you want to hear about um, cubicle transport and path induction, you'll want to uh, come back on Friday, and on Wednesday will be Egbert's uh, lecture in the hot track. Um, okay, uh, now stop sharing. Um, well, if people ask questions, they oh, might yeah. involve you uh, writing, yes. we'll, but we'll see. Um, so a bunch of people are saying thank you, and uh, we'll take a few questions. Um, see, there were a lot of good questions um, during your lecture that were already answered, but maybe uh, if any of the TAs have something they think we should ask right now, just well, go ahead. Uh, Ian has a, has a question, so I'm going to let him talk. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the way we define paths and cubicle is like more like traditional homotopy theory or classical maybe I should say, is that correct? Yes. So how does that like relate? Well, we've been saying that, you know, whenever you do homotopy theory in uh, type theory, it's like, it's like synthetic. Mm -hmm. How does that like relate if we change the way we define paths is it still is it still like considered synthetic yeah so it's definitely still synthetic um i mean so we essentially change the definition of of what the triple equals triple bar equality sign means but i mean so one thing i did not so okay I can say a few things about this, but let's, uh, so, right. So it's still synthetic for sure. Um, there are a few questions that might one might wonder, like, can I just define an equality type like we did before? So like data, triple bar prime, and then like the stuff you had before, and how does it relate to this thing? And it turns out you can, and you can prove that they are equivalent and that will fall out of, um, the fact that we can do path induction or uh, induction for this notion of, of path or equality as well. So they're equivalent. So in some sense, we are talking about the same synthetic things. Um, then there is another aspect of this is like, what are the, the mathematical models of what we're doing? Like um, these cubicle type theories grew out of a lot of work on these cubicle set models while Bukot 
grew out of this simplicial set model and there are a lot of like deep questions about how they are related and so on but i should probably not go too deep into that but uh, so there i mean it's an interesting question but uh, yes but we're still definitely doing synthetic um, homotopy theory while working cubically yeah yeah i think you could maybe argue it's like a little bit less synthetic or it's a little bit more concrete maybe and that's sort of why we're able to compute better yeah I guess, yeah, one way to think about it, another way to think about it is that we're taking really this kind of, like when you learn about uh, topology and homotopy theory, um, the textbook way, you learn that a path is a function out of an interval and so on. So we're really taking that kind of um, idea very literally and kind of throwing it into our type theory and proof assistant. Well, like the other, the Bukot way is more like a, one of these like amazing coincidences that the, the identity type that Permatiller formulated in the 70s has this high dimensional structure um, built in that is kind of magical. So, uh, yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> I don't know where I was going further with this, but uh, it's kind of a kind of yeah. You take this traditional point of view on what a path is, and you throw it into type theory. I guess that was my point. Yeah, right. Although keep in mind that the interval. I mean, you can sort of think of it like the act, the real interval, or something like that. But it doesn't yeah. have like real numbers in it. It doesn't have point yeah. five in it or anything. It's it's still it's an it's a synthetic version of an interval. Yes. Yeah. Right, yeah, synthetic, axiomatic, uh, yeah, whatever you, word you like. Yes, logical. Um, yes. So there's another hand raised. Uh, so Henry asked, are there examples that relate more to programming? Yes, and uh, I will try to show some on Friday. And if I don't have time, I will show some in the last lecture, yeah. But I mean, just to give you a little teaser, like this set truncated higher inductive types. So th there you can form, you know, set quotients. So I don't know, um, I don't know, lambda calculus modulo um, alpha equality or something um, would be an example of that. Um, so these kind of examples you could also do. I think a lot of the stuff that I mean, it's homotopy type theory. So a lot of people were interested in homotopy theory and then a lot of the examples were homotopy theoretic. But I mean, there's plenty of stuff one can do with more computer science-y, um, yeah, from a computer yeah, science the, perspective. Yeah. There's this really old paper by some people, uh, Carlo and Dan, never heard of them, about using higher <laughs> inductive types for, to represent patch theory, like in version control systems, which I think is really cool too. Yeah. Carla and I have a, had a Popple paper some years ago. Some, yeah, some year. And some years ago, like two years ago. Yeah, yeah. two years ago. Oh, it was all a blur. There was a pandemic in the middle. So it's, <laughs> anyway, it's still the current year. I don't believe it. <laughs> I don't believe it. Uh, anyway, so, so Max, Carlo, and Evan and I had a paper on uh, like internalizing representation independence with univalence. Um, so that's where I'm hoping to get in the last lecture a little bit. Um, where we really, really use the fact that higher inductive types and univalence compute to do kind of transporting progress and proofs between different types, um, this kind of stuff. Okay, uh, any last questions or maybe we should uh, call it here? Okay, well, um, as always, we can uh, continue our discussion on the Discord. Um, thanks again to Anders for his uh, lecture today. Thanks to my cat for um, for joining us at the end here. And uh, yeah, um, thanks for coming. <laughs>